Well, let me say welcome to you. It's good to see you this beautiful Thursday in Ted's TGS Chapel. I'm, I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity that we've had this week to sit under the teaching of Dr. George Davis, uh, a dear friend, a colleague through his service on the Board of Regents, and an alumnus of this institution. It's great to have you back, Dr. Davis, and we look forward to continuing our time of exploring in 1 Corinthians the messy realities of ministry in the church. We pray that God would strengthen us. Be reminded that there is a luncheon Q&A immediately following chapel today in Hinkson Hall. You're all warmly welcome to that time. It was a great time of conversation on Tuesday, and we look forward to that again today. But as we think about the realities of ministry um, and the messiness that often ensues, I want to draw our thoughts to the psalmist's confession that the Lord himself is our refuge. Would you stand with me and hear, as our call to worship, the words of Psalm 46? God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this hour when we can be gathered together in submission to your word, to your great and glorious promises for us in Jesus. God, we thank you for the word that we have received through our brother, Dr. George Davis. We thank you for the comfort and encouragement we have that in the midst of the difficulties and challenges of real life ministry, Christ is there with us in the midst of it. Where we celebrate the solidarity that we have in our Lord Jesus. Where we ask for your blessing on our time. Would you be pleased with our thanks and praise and adoration of your kindness to us? Would you give us ears to hear and soft spirits to receive the word that you have for us through our brother? We offer you this hour. Have your way in this time. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is found in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Listen now to God's holy word. This, then, is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Good to see you again. And uh, if you know, those of you who weren't with us on Tuesday, welcome. We started talking about the reality that ministry is messy. 
And in trying to help you remember that, we passed out M&Ms and just let you know we've got lots of them left over. So if you would like some of those, they're in the back. I encourage you to take them. They are yours. Also, you may have recalled, if you were here, that in doing that, I joked, come back on Thursday and we'll give away cars. So obviously, at one level, that was a joke. But I also want to be a man of my word. So with that in mind, I have these. So if you happen to have a small child and would like to pick one of these up, I'm going to leave them on the front row after the service. So uh, just to have something to uh, kind of lighten the mood as we talk about the messiness of ministry. So if you have a Bible, I want to ask you to uh, join with me in turning back to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to come back to Paul's relationship with the church here in Corinth. And, you know, as we talked on Tuesday, uh, we talked a lot about the reality that ministry is messy. It is hard. There are moments when it's difficult, you're uncertain, you don't know how to handle it, there's criticism, it's complicated. Those are some of the realities of ministry that you will face over the long haul as you engage a local church ministry. So the question I want us to think about this morning is this, how, how do we thrive in the mess? How do we handle it? I mean, if it's going to be difficult, if at times you're going to feel like you're over your head, if there are moments when you feel stretched, unappreciated, in the midst of all that, how do we engage it? How do we thrive? So that's the question I want us to look at briefly this morning. And with that in mind, I want to, I want to draw your attention to this text in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul begins, This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ, and those entrusted with the ministries of God. So how does Paul start to engage the reality of messiness? A couple of things I want to highlight for you, and, and arguably the first is the one I want to spend the most time on because I think it is crucial and it's something we don't always talk about. As you engage this text, as you see Paul in this very complicated situation that's really crazy, how does, how does he keep his bearings? And as we look at this opening paragraph, first of all, I want you to notice Paul's sense of identity. In the midst of the chaos, I think he's got a very clear sense of identity. And, and notice he describes himself, he describes the apostles as they're servants of Christ, and they are stewards, or as though, or those entrusted with the mystery of God. Now think about that for a moment. What Paul is doing, I think, in terms of his self-understanding is this. He is showing us that his identity is framed by the redemptive work of God. He's showing that how he understands himself, how he understands his ministry, is framed by this panoramic view of what God is doing and has done through the work of Christ, through the gospel. And, of course, it's through the gospel, and we've already seen this in Corinthians, it's through the gospel that God has invaded the present age, bringing about redemption through the cross. So Paul's sense of identity really begins foundational, foundationally with this framework of the redemptive work of God. And, and also be aware of the fact that for Paul, as he thinks about this framework of what God is doing, it really is eschatological in orientation. I mean, Paul says, look, things that have been hidden are now revealed. What God was planning to do, he has now done. And understood in that is the recognition that in light of what God is now doing, the new age has come, the old age is passing away. And I think this kind of framework is present throughout the, this book. It's actually present throughout the writings of Paul. We even see it, uh, I think, to some degree in chapter 4. In fact, let, let me show you this. One of the interesting ways in which I think this framework occurs concerns how Paul deals with the category of wisdom. Notice later in this uh, chapter Verse 10, we are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ, right? And we've already seen in the opening chapters, Paul talks about wisdom and foolishness. And I think part of the reason he does entails the Corinthian context. Remember, these were people, this was a cultural context where we're all excited about ambition, striving, improving our status. And within this, there was this infatuation with rhetoric and self-presentation and, and the understanding that if you get connected to one of these great traveling teachers, you're going to rise in status. So there had to be people in the Corinthian context, 
who were feeling pretty smug about themselves. Look at us, right? Now the church is unfolding and we're identifying with the powerful leaders. Aren't we wise? Aren't we powerful? Look at us. We're feeling better about ourselves. Paul can say you're puffed up, right? And so Paul uses the category of wisdom. But notice what Paul does. He uses the category of wisdom, but he gives it an eschatological twist. You know what? You're right. You're wise. Yeah, you guys are really smart there in Karn. But the wisdom you have bought into is passing away. Likewise, I know the work of the cross. I know the work of the gospel appears to be unimpressive and foolish. But it's actually the wisdom of God. So notice, Paul, Paul's identity is shaped by this framework, this huge picture of the redemptive work of God. And within that redemptive work, Paul has an understanding that in light of where I'm at now, there are certain things that are going to be, appear to be wise, but they're actually foolish. And there are certain things that are going to appear to be foolish, but they're actually wise. And can I suggest to you, we, we need to adopt this framework. This needs to be part of your identity as you grow into ministry. You need to understand, this is the context in which we work, right? We, we, we work within this grand redemptive plan of God, but in the midst of that plan, some of the things that are going to appear to be really smart are actually passing away. And at times, the work of the gospel, which seems unimpressive, negligible, foolish, is actually a manifestation of the wisdom of God. Now let me just show you one of the realities of what this looks like in pastoral ministry. One of the realities is this, as we, as we work with people, right, in and outside the church, as you build relationships with people and, and build yourself into their lives and hopefully build relationships within the broader community of which you, you work, you're going to realize that for the most part, people really are seeking to do smart things. For the most part, people really do want their lives to thrive. They really want to succeed. They want to live well. And they've got some vision of what that looks like. In their own way, they are pursuing some form of wisdom. I mean, in my experience, no one sets out to sabotage his or her life, right? People don't go into marriage saying, let's see if we can really make this difficult so it falls apart in 10 years. Nonetheless, people don't realize that the wisdom they are buying into, the wisdom that is shaking, shaping their lives and their sin and brokenness is wisdom with an expiration date. And so Paul has this robust understanding of the redemptive work of God and the reality that within that, you know what? Things aren't always going to be as they appear. And as you go into ministry, you, you've got to adopt this mindset. This needs to shape how you look at your environment and how you look at yourself. And can I show you just one reason why this is important for you right now? Even as a student, even if you're not in any way serving in a formal leadership capacity, it is important right now because some of you have already had to deal with situations where someone looks at you and says, why are you going to seminary? You would have been a great engineer. I guess it's some, some of you have had that conversation with friends or family. At times I've worked with seminary students who said, you know, my parents feel like they sacrificed for me. I got this great undergraduate education and they feel like I'm throwing it all away. You need to adopt this framework right now because there are going to be people who look at you even now and say, I, I, don't, I don't get it, right? That's foolishness. I still remember, it's been about, I, this is probably 10 years ago. I'm in a repair shop. And I'm, I'm talking, start a conversation with the owner. I say, you know, I need someone who can really help me work on a grandfather clock. I need to have a grandfather clock repaired. And she, we just entered this wonderful conversation. And in the course of this conversation, here's what she says. She said, you know what? And this is North Dakota. <laughs> Get a little bit of the accent there. So she said, you know, I've got this guy. He's a maestro with clocks. He would be glad to help you. He was so amazing with what he can do with clocks. And she said, I don't get it. She says, if he wanted to, he can make a wonderful living repairing clocks, but he's a youth pastor. And then, I kid you not, she looked at me and she said this. I don't get this pastor thing. He could actually do something else. 
And without saying a word, I pull out my card, I hand it to her, and I said, hi, I'm George Davis. I can't do anything else. I'm a pastor. <laughs> right? And so our, our identity needs to be shaped by the reality of God's redemptive plan but an understanding that within that, things will not be as they appear. And I think that's, that's true for Paul. So notice, right, he's got, he's got this big identity in terms of the framework. And then within that framework, within the framework of God's redemptive plan, he has an understanding of his role. Notice once again, we ought to regard ourselves as servants of Christ and as those entrusted, or you could, the term there, steward, as stewards of the mysteries of God. So Paul uses two different terms early on as he's describing his role. Servant and steward. The first, top, the first term usually has, uh, I think, the idea of more menial service. The second term uh, can refer to uh, an estate manager, someone with a higher level of responsibility, a person who is expected to manage, administrate the affairs, the resources of the owner. I don't want to push this, but I think it's possible, in essence, then, that in using these terms, uh, Paul is describing both the, the ordinary, everyday realities of ministry as well as the responsibilities of, of leading, of influencing, of teaching that, that are a part of ministry. So, so within this big picture frame of what God is doing and the realities that come with that, the craziness that is a part of that now, Paul says, here's my role. I'm a servant of Christ. I am a steward. I have a responsibility to steward the mysteries of God. And let me show you why this is so important, just to have this understanding of your role. I think, first of all, in this passage, it provides focus. Notice verse 2. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. That is, the stewards have been given, who have been given the gospel now must be proved to be faithful in how they administer that gospel, how they handle that gospel. And here's one of the reasons why this is so important to understand, right? As you go into ministry, as you go into a local church context, there are always going to be more things to do than you're able to do. In any ministry situation, there's always going to be a sense in which the work is never done, in which the work is never complete. Now, arguably, right, right now you're in an academic context, and the truth is you start the semester, and I don't know if you still do it this way. I still remember when I was a student at Trinity Start, you go the first day, and of course you get the syllabus, and once you, you know, kind of pick yourself off the floor with syllabus shock, you... You know, and, right? Don't you ever wonder, don't these guys know I'm taking other classes? Do you still do that? Anybody you want me to talk to, I'd be glad to do that as a regent for a certain price, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why, right? But here's what I did. Then I got out my calendar, and what did I do? I went through the calendar. Okay, here's, I need to do this, 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 this. It was all there in black and white, and I knew when I checked out the list, I was finished, complete. Ministry doesn't come with a syllabus. It doesn't come with little boxes you can check off and say, oh, it's all done, I'm finished. It never does that. So notice, here's Paul in the midst of this chaos, right? It's a crazy situation in Corinth, all kinds of issues. There's debate, there's factionalism, there are different expectations at work. And in the midst of all that craziness, he calmly says, here's my sense of identity, here's my role, and here's what I need to do. Here's my focus. I need to be faithful, reliable, trustworthy in exercising this responsibility. I am a servant, right? I am dependent on God. This is ultimately his work. But I'm also a steward who has a responsibility to live out, to proclaim, and pursue ministry of the gospel in a healthy way. And in essence, Paul says, in the midst of all that I could be doing, this is my focus, right? I'm called to be a faithful, trust, uh, faithful, reliable, trustworthy individual in engaging these responsibilities. Now, with that in mind, let me, just, let me tell you a little bit of what this looks like in my life right now. To be honest with you, I'm in a chaotic season of ministry. Um, 
Our executive pastor took a new position at the end of February, and so right now we're in the search for a new individual to join our staff, and in the meantime, I have had to assume some of those responsibilities. And it can be chaotic for me. I mean, last, last uh, Wednesday, I, you know, I went through seven meetings in a day. By the time I got home, I, I just looked like a Picasso painting, right? I had been pulled in all sorts of different directions. So in the midst of that kind of craziness, how do you, how do, how do you stay focused? And just one observation, one of the things I've just learned in my own ministry experience is this. There are certain texts, certain themes in Scripture that I find helpful in bringing me back to this sense of responsibility. What is, you know, in the midst of all the stuff that I'm having to do, what is, what is my calling? What is my focus? Even as Paul talks about, I've been called to be faithful. And so there's certain texts that really have to live in my life to bring me back to that sense of focus. One of those texts is Colossians 1, 24 to 28. And uh, in many ways, I would argue that's probably the closest thing in Paul's writings that we have to a personal, personal mission statement. And in that text, which interestingly also has, I think, a robust eschatological framework, Paul says, among other things, he's absolutely committed to presenting people mature in Christ. And there are some weeks this passage just has to go back and forth across my mind. This is what it's about. George, this is your focus. In the life of our church, here's how we describe it. We talk about taking next steps. That's one of our core values. It's how we describe the value of disciple making. If you talk to our staff, they will tell you, you squeeze George hard enough, at some point he's going to talk about taking next steps. And for me, that, that's a way to come back to the reality that in the midst of all that we could be doing, in the midst of the busyness that we could allow to crowd our calendars and our programming, what is our calling? What does it look like to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God. So can I suggest to you that in understanding your identity in ministry, you need to understand your role in this call to be faithful to the gospel in such a way that it provides focus. Because there's always going to be more to do. There are always going to be forces pulling you in different directions. That's part of ministry. But furthermore, can I suggest to you that for Paul, this... This reality of identity, this role that he has, provides not only focus, but it also provides freedom. Look at verses 3 and following. Paul writes, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, once again, notice, man, this is a chaotic environment, right? Criticisms, factions, division. And in the midst of that, Paul says, look, it's God who will proclaim the ultimate verdict. And that, that may not seem like a, a deeply profound statement, but do you realize how liberating that is? In the midst of the messiness of ministry to say, ultimately, it is God who proclaims the final verdict. So here he is, right, in this situation with all sorts of expectations, expectations about leadership and communication, expectations of all the ways in which he has fallen short, all the ways he has disappointed, all the ways he has failed to live up to cultural stereotypes. And in the midst of all that, he says, okay, but you see, here's my identity. And in, the, in, in that identity, I understand, ultimately, I'm called to be faithful as a steward. And ultimately, it's God who gets to render the final verdict on how that is looked. And can I tell you, this is, this is so important in local church ministry. Because the reality is this, ministry environments are always ambiguous. Ministry environments are always at some level complicated and with factors pulling you in different directions, different expectations, different viewpoints, various forms of criticism, founded and unfounded, and you can feel like you are pulled in every direction. 
And if your expectation is somehow I'm going to keep everybody happy and somehow I'm going to keep everybody on board, that is a losing proposition. <laughs> I still remember being somewhat relieved when I read Tim Keller's book, uh, Center Church. And in the book he talks about preaching and he talks about the fact that people have different perspectives on preaching and people always will draw the line between preaching and teaching differently. And what's interesting is if you read between the lines of the book, you realize, you know what? He's been criticized about his preaching. And I read that and I almost put the book down. How can you criticize Tim Keller? And I realized as well, if they're going to criticize Keller, oh yeah, does that mean there will probably be people that criticize me? And the truth is yes. And so if somehow my goal is I've got to keep everybody on board and meet the expectations of everyone in the community, that will be a losing proposition. And here is the real danger. So in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the criticism and the competing ideas and various expectations of ministry, the reality is you can lose your identity. You can lose your sense of who you are. And in this ambiguity, you can become vulnerable to anxiety, to depression, to bitterness, to loss of motivation. And tragically, at some point, it will happen to you or it will happen to someone you know. Recently, uh, one of the members of our staff was having to go through a really challenging, a really messy situation. It was hard, it was awkward, there was you know, some unhealthy criticism, and uh, yeah, it was messy. <laughs> and so her supervisor and I walked her through that situation, and she did, I was just so proud of her. She just did such a wonderful job of responding in grace and truth. But even though she responded so well in the course of that, she made this observation to me. Here's what she said. It was just so profound. She said, you know what? I've never gone through anything like this before. And she says, this feels so unsettling. And what she was feeling, what she was describing to me was the ambiguity that comes with ministry and the ways in which in the midst of that ambiguity we kind of lose ourselves. Who am I? And are we just people that are a composite of all the expectations around us? And so we ended up, we kind of ended up having a conversation along the lines of this passage and talking through the whole issue of identity and ministry and what it entails. Now, this doesn't mean we disregard criticism. It doesn't mean there's no, no element of evaluation. I mean, Paul clearly talks about evaluation elsewhere. No need for input of others. But what it does mean is this. We need to turn down the volume on some of that and realize even in the midst of that, the final verdict is ultimately God's. And can I suggest to you, this is significant, not only because you will encounter crazy expectations, unsubstantiated criticisms, just the realities of ministry. This is also important because over time, you know what some of you are going to discover? Some of you are going to discover that your worst critic is you. And there are going to be moments where you truly need to come back to this passage and hear Paul say, I don't even judge myself. Moments when you need to remind yourself that we don't make the final judgment. And I think clearly in the passage, if you follow Paul's line of argument, he says, we don't make the final judgment because we don't really know motivations of the heart and we don't know the full story yet. Last month, I uh, got in the mail just this wonderful card. Just so encouraged. It was, a, um, it was a card from a young adult who had been part of our church ministry in Fargo. And, and she wrote, Dear George, the card went something like this. I, I want to thank you for something you once said on a Sunday. And this is probably 10 or 12 years ago. And she said, you know, she described what I had said, and she said, you know, that really got me thinking about working cross-culturally in a way I'd never done before. And then, then she described how this had now become the trajectory 
of her life. And she said, I want you to know what, what you said changed my life. And you know my first response reading that? I put the card down, scratched my head and said, I don't remember saying that. I, I don't remember that message. And I tell you that story not to in any way impress you with my homiletical skill. I tell you the story to say, you know what, I don't remember the message. That wasn't some Sunday where I went home and go, well, that's one for the ages. Christianity Day is ready, waiting for that one on their cover, right? And, you know, I, no, I didn't, it was, it was, it was just another Sunday, right? Another Sunday of seeking to handle the good news of Jesus Christ in a week-by-week -week basis in a local church. And yet the reality is, as we live out this identity, right, as stewards of the mysteries of God, and we allow that to provide our focus, and we live in the freedom of knowing that God makes the final verdict, he is at work in ways we don't fully understand or imagine. So notice this identity. Engage this as you move into ministry. You, who you are and how you approach ministry is to sh be shaped by the grand vision, the grand picture of what God is doing. And you need to understand the reality that in that grand movement right now, things that appear wise aren't always wise, and the things that appear foolish may actually be the work of God. So don't be surprised or scared by that. In the midst of that, understand your role as a steward of the mysteries of God and allow that to provide focus and freedom. Okay, I'm running out of time. I still got a lot of text, so I'm going to need you to listen a little bit faster, okay? So, but here's what I want to do. Obviously, in looking at this text, I wanted to work through the first part more slowly because I do think this issue of identity is absolutely foundational in uh, healthy pastoral ministry. So what I want to do for the last just 10 minutes is just pick up the pace a little bit and ask this question. If this is my identity, right, I'm... I'm, I'm a steward of the mysteries of God, a servant of Christ who is required to be faithful, reliable in handling the mysteries of God. What will that look like? I mean, let's, let's just talk a little bit more practically, practically. What will that look like to be a faithful pastor? And I think particularly in these opening chapters of Corinthians, I think we can highlight just a couple of things. First of all, I think it will entail being faithful in communication. Now, in chapter 4, Paul does not deal with this uh, specifically, but we've already seen Paul address the whole issue of communication in chapter 2 when he talks about how he came into Corinth. So central to how he sees his ministry is the importance of being faithful and reliable in handling the gospel in his preaching and teaching ministry. Now, you're preparing for that. This is one of the strengths of, of, of Trinity in helping you become faithful in handling God's word and faithful in communication. And I think that's part of what it means to handle well the mysteries, the mysteries of the gospel. But as we continue in this text, I think not only uh, do we see the importance of being faithful in communication, we also see the importance of being faithful in hardship. Right? Look at verses... Eight and following. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put the apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to the angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we, kind, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. Now, of course, this passage is, is loaded with irony. But I think in describing the work of the apostles, notice he really is showing the, the reality of being faithful in hardships. And, of course, as he describes the humble state of the apostles, I think what he's saying here is linked to what he talked about in chapter 1 when he uh, showed us that God has chosen what is foolish to shame the wise. 
So even though he portrays the apostles in humble terms, he is arguing this is exactly the way God works. Now, here, here's one of the reasons we really need to pay attention to this. I mean, as you look at Paul describe his hardships and his challenges in ministry, hardships, I think, that will be clearer when we come to 2 Corinthians, particularly for those of us who are North American evangelicals. We need to pay attention to this because we did not grow up with a robust theology of suffering. We did not grow up with a perception that at times there would be sacrifices involved with following Christ, or more specifically, with serving in ministry. Nonetheless, Paul shows this is the reality. Now, hear me clearly, I'm not talking about hardships or challenges that are self-inflicted. Some of the challenges we bring into ministry, we bring on ourselves. We're imperfect, we have failures, we have limitations. I'm simply acknowledging that in ministry, we may experience difficulty, hardships, obstacles because of our desire to be these faithful stewards. Let me, let me just give you one example from Paul's life. I think we learn from Paul that being faithful in hardship means you may have to make a decision where you choose the hardest option. Being faithful in hardship means you may have to make a decision in which you choose intentionally the hardest option. Once again, remember the social context of Corinth. Paul comes into Corinth and he is perceived to be just another one of the traveling teachers, right? The sophists. And as they would come into a, a major city, part of the cultural expectation would be this. You, you try to impress people with your rhetoric and in so doing, you can generate students and you can generate patrons who will support you financially. But Paul takes the harder path. He does not enter a patronage relationship because he knew he would be obligated to that person in an unhealthy way. So he chooses to support himself. He takes the harder option. So when you experience hardships and challenges, don't be surprised by that. Don't be unnerved by that. Remember, we follow a crucified Messiah. This is what the journey looks like. Don't presume God has abandoned you. Don't simply look for the easy way out. Be faithful in hardship. And very quickly, just one other thing in this passage. We, we also need to be faithful in relationships. We get to the next paragraph. Paul writes, verse 14 and following, I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. Therefore I urge you to imitate me. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way, in, my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everyone in every church. Now I think in Paul's life, as he seeks to be faithful, he's faithful in communication, he is faithful in hardship, and he is faithful in relationship. We get to this paragraph, and the imagery changes as he talks about himself as, as the spiritual father of the Corinthian church. And as he talks about being a father, I think on the one hand, it is, it's an image of authority. It's a very powerful image of authority in the ancient world. But it's also an image of commitment and compassion. Notice in the passage, the comparison is between a father and a guardian. In essence, you know, as Paul compares himself to guardians or slaves who would, who would watch over children of the elite, he's saying, you know what, I'm not a paid babysitter to you. This isn't just a job for me. I'm your father. This is, this is an image of commitment and compassion. It's an image of authority, but it's also an image of, of commitment and compassion. And I think this is important. In some circles, you'll get the idea that the pastor is just supposed to be nice, right? Loving and compassionate. That's what we pay you to do. And if you're not careful over time in pastoral ministry, you may slide into that persona where you're nice, you're well-liked, you don't stir up trouble. 
But in this, as you see, Paul both as kind of the authoritative father as well as the compassionate father recognize that his desire and willingness to exercise discipline and authority ultimately flows out of his love. Because that, that's what they could need. You know that if you're a parent. And I think here it becomes clear the opposite of love is not discipline. It is indifference. And let me just acknowledge, you know, in describing, as you read this passage, in describing his willingness either to come, you know, in love and a gentle spirit or to come with a rod of discipline, Paul is showing an amazing range of relational flexibility. And in my experience, that range of flexibility has to be learned. I think most of us naturally do one better than the other. Some of us here in leadership positions will naturally gravitate to being authoritative, direct, and, and moving things forward. Others of us are going to naturally gravitate to being compassionate and, you know, gentle and, and meek in certain contexts. But I think part of pastoral ministry is learning to expand your relational bandwidth and being able to develop in those different areas. So one of the ways in which Paul engages Right, this church relationally is with the flexibility to give this church what it needs. Very quickly, just notice one other thing about Paul's relationship with his church as he exercises this pastoral role, and that is this. He says, I'm sending Timothy. He's going to remind you of my way of life. Imitate me. Now, for the sake of time, let me just bullet a couple of very quick observations about this. I'm going to send Timothy. I want you to imitate me. Very quickly. First of all, notice you can't take people where you're not going. You can't take people where you're not going. If this is simply a job for you, if you just put your life in neutral, you are not going to be faithful to the gospel. You are not going to be faithful to the people you serve. Paul isn't simply wanting to lead people there. He is wanting to share his life because he is moving in the same direction. Likewise, I would say this. One of the greatest gifts you can give the people you serve is your own journey with Christ. One of the greatest gifts you can give the people you serve is your own journey with Christ. And this is what Paul is doing in this letter right here. One other brief observation is about Paul is he sending Timothy. I think in this passage, it's very clear that Paul understands relationships are critical to the disciple-making process. Right? Notice what he says. I'm going to send Timothy. And he's going, he's going to, it's not just his teaching, he's going to remind you of my way of life. And of course, understood, implicit in that is the reality. I've been in relationship with this church in some form or fashion. You have seen who I am. You have seen how I've operated. You have seen how I have sought to live out the cross. And now Timothy's going to come and he's going to remind you of that way of life. And I think for some of us, this is very important to observe. And it's important for us to observe for this reason. Many of us are more reflective, we're analytic, we're academically wired, we love learning. And consequently, when we go into pastoral ministry, it is easy to assume that discipleship is simply the process of giving people more information. But that's not Paul's approach. It's not just learn more. We need to see what it looks like. And that requires relationship. And if your default setting is simply the assumption that sanctification equals information transfer, let this passage, let Paul's ministry stretch you and challenge you in this regard. If you'd like to kind of think a little bit more about that, let me just read the book I'm actually reading on the plane during this trip, uh, James K.A. Smith's new book, You Are What You Love, but his First couple of chapters kind of unpack this understanding of discipleship, and it challenges our understanding that discipleship is information transfer. So if that's, that's a place where you're at, I encourage you to let Paul challenge you in this regard. Now, we've covered a lot of terrain. Thank you for hanging with me this morning, but let me just come back to where we're at, what we see here. So in the midst of this chaos, how does Paul handle the messiness? and thrive in the midst. Well, he has, he, has, he has a clear sense of his identity, right? A framework of what God is doing, and within that reality of what God is doing, he understands his role as a servant and a steward. 
a steward of the gospel. And in focusing on that role, it, it gives him direction, it gives him freedom. And then as he seeks to live to be faithful, he is, he's faithful in communication, faithful in hardship, faithful in relationship. And I think as you take this pattern seriously, you too can learn to thrive in the realities of ministry, even when it gets messy. Again, let me just thank you. Thank you for being here at Trinity. Many of you, you've already taken major steps in this journey of following Christ and serving him. For some of you already, this is a great sacrifice. And I just want to encourage you in the journey you're on. But even as you continue to take steps, know that it, it can be messy. In fact, the reality is for you right now, there are surprises in your future that none of us know about yet. And at times it will be messy. But as that happens, as you encounter that, don't pull back. Don't disengage. Don't presume that God has abandoned you. Seek to be a faithful steward of the mercies of God. And as you embrace this calling, do so with the assurance that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let me pray for you. Gracious God, as we, uh, as we come and, and close out our time together in terms of Paul's ministry, and think about the chaotic reality of the Corinthian church, I pray we'd be open to the reality that for us, as we go into ministry, at times this will be our experience as well. But even in the midst of that possibility, would you also invite us to see what it means to find our identity in the work of Jesus Christ. To see our role in terms of individuals who are to be faithful stewards of your mysteries. And I pray even now we would begin to allow that to really saturate who we are. So that in the things we're doing now, it provides focus and also freedom to understand that we don't fully Observe or know what you're doing now. You simply call us to be faithful. And in doing that, may we rest in the assurance that you are at work and in the reality that our labor is not in vain. In Jesus' name, amen.